know where you live. They feed on your flaws. They drain your time. And they never leave you alone. Hey, I need to run a few errands. Can you watch my dog? Again. Thanks for nothing, John. <laughs> Get this cheap $2 Kmart cape out of my sight. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Oh, things you would do, hey? Uh, my name is Daniel Indrajaya. I'm one of the pastors here at The Rocks. Um, let me take this opportunity to personally welcome all of you to our church. Uh, I don't want to take for granted that you choose to spend your Sunday morning here with us. I think that's great. And I'd like to welcome our YouTube viewers and podcast listeners as well. Thanks for joining in. Hey, um, as Chloe has mentioned, we are in the second part of our sermon series that we started last week. We're calling it Relational Vampires, Loving the People Who Suck the Life Out of You. And we all know people like that in our church um, and in our community, in our school, in our workplace. And, um, and we have to live with them, don't we? Uh, people who are needy, people who are moody. And last week, we talked about controlling people, how difficult it is to live with controlling people. And John has done such a great job last week. I want to encourage you, if you missed that message, to catch it on uh, YouTube and podcast. You'll be really, really blessed. And today, I want to talk about something that we all have faced sometime in the past, or if you haven't, maybe sometime in the future for sure. And we're talking about critical people this morning. Actually, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you actually know someone who thinks their spiritual gift is fault-finding? Raise your hand. You, they think, <laughs> that's right. Um, we all know someone like that. If you don't raise your hand, maybe you are that controlling person, unfortunately. Actually, this is a good way to find out. If you came to church this morning and you already noticed three things that you don't like about our church, maybe the place is too dark, the music's too loud, the pastor's too handsome, you know? Um, that means maybe you are one of those people. And all joking aside though, this is such an important topic because for some of you, this is too close to home. Some of you, unfortunately, uh, you grew up with a really, really critical parent. No matter what you did, you just could not live up to their high standard. You tried and you tried and you tried and you just couldn't do it. And it has affected you greatly. Some of you, you are right now, as we speak, live with a partner that, that are so critical of you. It's so hard to, to live with this person. You know, you can never do things right. You can never be good enough for this person. You know, that you're not strong enough. You're not skinny enough. Uh, you don't do enough things. Or when you do things, you're always wrong. I'm not talking about my wife. My wife is not here with me, but she's listening to the podcast. I'm not talking about you, honey. But some of us live with people like this, and, and we think like, no, how do I continue to live with people like this? And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I want to tell you a story. I read this from the, from the internet. Where else? Uh, there was a school teacher who wrote on the board this. Nine times one equals seven. Nine times two equals 18. Nine times three equals 27, and so on until 9 times 10 equals 90. And as she turned to face the students, all the students were laughing at her. And then she asked them, why are you laughing at me? And they were all pointing at that first equation. You did that equation wrong. And then the teacher said this, 
You know what, students? I did this on purpose because I wanted to teach you a very important lesson. I did this equation correctly nine times, and none of you gave me credit for it. None of you congratulated me for it. And I did one equation wrong, and you all laughed and criticized me. And then the teacher said this, in this world, you will do one million things correctly, and the world will not give you credit for it. The, no, the world will not give you honor, or the world will, will not acknowledge you for it, but the world will criticize you, will laugh at you for the one thing that you will do wrong in your life. And when they, when they do, remember this. Remember that you can rise above the laughter. You can rise above the criticism and continue to do what is right. And I thought, you know, I saw that story. What a powerful reminder for all of us that this is just a common occurrence in our life, right? In fact, I want us to say this together this morning before we continue. Let's say this together on the count of three, all right? One, two, three. I will always be criticized. One more time. One, two, three. I will always be criticized. Doesn't matter how wonderful you are as a person. It doesn't matter how upright, how wise you are in your decision making. There will be people who will criticize what you do and how you do it, right? In fact, the more successful you are, the more criticism you will get. The more famous you are, the more in the the position of authority you are, the more you will be criticized. And if you open the pages of the Bible, you will see that a lot of people in the Bible, they were criticized too. Moses was criticized for marrying a Midianite, you know. Abraham was criticized. Even Jesus, John the Baptist, they were criticized as well. In Luke chapter 7, verse 33, 34, this is what it says. This is amazing because they were criticizing John the Baptist and Jesus for the complete opposite thing. For John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he's possessed by a demon. And in verse 34, the Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. You see, no matter what you do, whether you eat, one, uh, you eat bread or drink wine or not, you will get criticized either way, all right? So this morning, I think it's a great idea for all of us to come together in a place like this, in a time like this, to look at what does the Bible say about this? And how should we handle these difficult people in our lives? And, and what, how do we respond when criticism comes our way? All right? Uh, if you pay attention, if you lean in, I trust that the Spirit of God is going to speak to your situation right now because I don't believe in coincidence. I believe everybody is here for a reason. So if you, if you lean in with me, uh, let's le- explore this idea together. All right? And see what God has to say to us through his word. The first thing that you got to do when you receive criticism is this. Um, You need to consider the source, all right? You need to consider the source. People will criticize you from left and right. You got to ask yourself a question. Who is this person that is giving me this criticism or feedback, as they like to call it, right? Doesn't matter. I'm using the the two terms interchangeably, feedback and, and criticism, constructive or not constructive. So you need to ask yourself this question, who is giving me this feedback or this criticism? Is this someone who loves me? Is this someone who cares for me? Is this someone who is championing me? Is this someone who will be there for me no matter you know, how bad I fail? Is this the person that wants to see me succeed in what I do? Or is this a person who is a serial critic? All right, you got to ask yourself that question because if that comes, that criticism, that feedback comes from, from a person who just likes to criticize everything, then you don't need to pay attention to that criticism, all right? And, and the person who needs help is actually not you, but that person. People who criticize everything are the ones that need help, not you. Guess what? If they don't criticize you, they will criticize somebody else because that's just what they do, all right? And and this is what people with a critical spirit don't realize. People with a critical spirit don't always realize that they are hurting people when they they do this, all right? You might be that person. you You don't even realize that when you criticize people without considering that person's feeling, without 
really thinking about the best for that person, you are destroying their lives. You're not only hurting their feeling, but you are destroying their life. You know, before Crazy Rich Asian, there is another movie back, back in the 90s that's very popular called The Joy Luck like Club. In that movie, there was this character. Her name is Waverly Jong. She was a, a child prodigy. She became a national chess champion at eight years old. And, and the parents kept on criticizing her, telling her that she was nothing, that she was not good enough. And this is how she responded to that criticism from her parents, uh, from her mom especially. This is what she said. What she said to me, that's the mom, was like a curse. This power I had, this belief in what I'd been given, I could actually feel it draining away. I could feel myself becoming so ordinary. And all the secrets that I once saw, I couldn't see anymore. All I could see were my mistakes and my weaknesses and the best part of me disappeared. You don't realize if you are a person with a critical spirit, what it can do to the people around you. Here's another thing people with a critical spirit don't realize. They don't realize that they actually have a critical spirit. This is something that is very difficult for you to see in the mirror. And then they will mask their critical spirit with statements like this. Maybe you're familiar. Maybe you heard some of this before. I'm just being honest. I'm saying this because no one else will. You know, you, you, you hide behind these, statement, these statements in order to be, you know, critical of people around you. He was, never a bad, he was such a bad listener. She never takes any advice. He doesn't know what he's doing. You know, you talk about this behind your boss's back. You talk about this, you know, about your wife, about your children and all that. You're not helping anybody, all right? You are having a critical spirit and you don't even know it. You are the one who needs help if that's you. Because behind every critical spirit, there are just many roots that cause it. I don't know what causes you to have a critical spirit, if that's who you are, but maybe this list will help. A lot of the, the criticism that comes from your mouth, a lot of the negativity that comes from you, maybe is the result of one of these or more than one of these, all right? For example, selfish nature, our sinful nature. Actually, all of us have this tendency to be critical. All of us have this tendency to be negative. Selfish nature, negative self-image, little or no grace for people, negativity, insecurity, bitterness, envy, pride, lack of control, um, insubordination. You know, you feel like you can do a better job. You know, you, you don't... I'm not talking about self-control. I'm talking about you want to be in control and you're not. And that's why you don't want to submit to your boss. You don't want to submit to your teacher. And then you, 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 you become insubordinate and you criticize your superior because you think you can do a better job. Maybe you're right, but insubordination is still insubordination. So I want to ask you, which one of these lists is yours? All right? In fact, before you give criticism to people, or feedback as you call it, I want you to stop and ask yourself, am I saying this out of one or more of this? Am I being bitter? Am I envious of this person? Am I prideful? That's why I said this. I, th I think I know better. Uh, is it my neg the negativity on my side? Is it because I'm insecure? You know, actually this is a way for me to to, to gain control, to be more, you know, to be more assured of myself. Uh, have I shown grace to this person when I, when I say what, uh, you know, what I wanted to say? So all this, to me, is a very, very important reminder. Uh, it's a good list for you and for me as well, actually, to just do a self-check before we criticize someone, before we destroy their life. Ask yourself, who am I? Who am I to this person? What is my real motive really in saying this? Because if I'm not careful, I'm not only going to hurt the person that I'm going to talk, that I'm giving advice to, but I might just destroy their life. All right? Listen, to, um, in Matthew 7, uh, three verse, uh, verse 3 and 4, this is what Jesus said. This is what you needed to do. All right? Before you give that constructive feedback, this is what you need to do. Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? 
I actually have a log right here, right now, that I want to show you. Um, see, this is, <laughs> this, may this be a reminder for you and for me, before you say anything to anyone, just imagine this, how ridiculous this is, right? You talk to someone, hey, Dev, man, you know, I don't really like your T-shirt. I think that's a bit too tight for you. I know you have a good body and all, you know. Um, where does it come from? Maybe I'm envious of his awesome ripped body. That's why I said that, you know. When you have a lock in your eye, how can you see clearly? When you can't even see your own faults, when you can't even see your own shortcomings, how can you have a clear view to say and, 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 and say something positive to the people that you're talking to, right? Notice, Jesus did not say that you cannot help others to get better. Jesus did not say you cannot take the speck out of your friend's eye. He did not say that. You can. Only after you take the log out of your own eye, all right? The order is important. The order is important. You do this first, and then you can say something. After you check your motive, after you check the reason why you say what you want to say, then, of course, you can do it. There's always a place for constructive, con constructive criticism, all right? Paul says this in Romans 14, verse 1. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. I think that's a good advice, all right? That's number one. Consider the source. The source. Where does the criticism come from? Number two, examine the truthfulness of the criticism, all right? Our initial reaction is always defensive. Trust me, when I listen to feedback, that's my gut reaction as well. You know, you immediately put up a wall like, ah, you know, you can come up with 1,001 reasons why the criticism is not true. But you got to first examine the truthfulness. Don't make it personal, all right? A lot of us are so touchy these days. You know, we make everything personal. Remember what I said. If it comes from someone who is a serial critic, that's the person who needs help anyway, not you. They're going to criticize anybody else. You know, if it's not you, it's somebody else. So don't take it personally. In fact, I learned this a long time ago in a life skill course, and I think it's very, very useful, and I've been using it ever since. And this is worth coming to church for this morning too. This is what you do when you're about to receive or give criticism or feedback. All right? This is very powerful. Always receive criticism with your head and... Give criticism with your heart. How powerful is that? When you receive criticism, don't take it to heart. Take it with your head. Examine. Is it true? You know, with your head. Don't take it personally. But when you are about to give feedback, when you're about to give criticism, give it with your heart. Think about the reaction this person will have. Think about not hurting that person. Think about the best for that person before, even though what you say may be true, all right? But the way you say it makes a difference. When you say it makes a difference, when you give it with your heart, you will be considerate of all these things, okay? So you need to know when you examine the criticism that comes your way, there are actually three types of criticism. Number one is malicious criticism. This is criticism based on fear, insecurity, envy, and other agendas. I don't know, okay? That's one. The second is accurate criticism. Essentially valid, even though not 100% correct, all right? That's accurate criticism. Inaccurate criticism is criticism that is essentially not valid, but there's a degree of truth in it. You still need to pay attention to it, okay? So how do you deal with all these different types of criticism? Simply, number one, respond to malicious criticism with grace, with grace. God has dealt with you with grace. He has dealt with me with grace. Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian here this morning, let me tell you, Christianity, you can summarize Christianity with one word, and that word is grace, all right? Jesus Christ came to show us grace. He did not come to condemn us, as we have spoken before. So this is very important. Listen to what Jesus says. In Matthew 5, 44, 45, I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. You are already, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are already a child of God. 
but a lot of us, we're not acting like one, yeah? We're acting like the people of this world who, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. No, that's not how you respond to your enemy. No matter how malicious the criticism is, we try our very best to treat that person with grace, okay? Um, how about this, though? Sometimes it is very difficult, isn't it? You know, sometimes the best thing for you to do, if that person doesn't want to have anything to do with you, doesn't want to accept grace from you, maybe the very best thing is for you to ignore that criticism and stay away from that person, all right? Listen to what Jesus says here. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So, you know, if it drains you, if this person is always putting you down and somehow you cannot shake it off, maybe it's time for you to just, you know, show that person grace. Do not say anything that you regret, but instead just say, thank you very much, but I'm going to live my life the way I see it. And, you know, you can live your life the way you see it. You know, don't throw pearls to pigs, all right? You don't have to take malicious criticism and then take it to heart and let it destroy your life. Okay, I know some of you, you are still holding on right now to malicious criticism. You cannot set yourself free from it. Let me tell you, let it go. Okay, let it go. Christ has set you free. You are free indeed. If you are not free, it's because you, are, you choose to hold on to those, you know, things that bind you. So let it go already. Okay, number two. What about accurate criticism? What do you do? Use accurate criticism as an opportunity to change, as an opportunity to change. Because, let's face it, none of us is perfect. All of us have blind spots. You know, we don't always make the right decisions. We don't always act correctly. We don't even know our blind spots, right? I don't have a blind spot, but you have. So I'm telling you this this morning. Better watch out for your blind spot. I'm just kidding, of course, you're so serious. I have blind spots too, okay? We all have blind spots. That's why we need to listen. We need to listen to others, whatever what they have to say to us. Do not dismiss it right away, but instead, identify the source where it comes from, especially if it comes from someone who loves you, especially if it comes from someone who's for you and wants to see you grow. You better listen to that advice, all right? Proverbs um, chapter 15, verse 31 says this. If you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the wise. What that means is you will be wise yourself. If you want to be wise, it's very simple. Just listen to the constructive criticism coming your way. Don't dismiss everything as negative. Don't dismiss everything as antagonistic towards you. No, not all of them. Some of them have, you know, uh, have valid points. So you have to take them on. That's number two. Number three, use inaccurate criticism Criticism as an opportunity to teach. That's what you do. If you have a chance, maybe you know it, that, nah, this, this is not right. This is not, absolutely this is not right. Maybe, you know, you don't have to run away. You can face that criticism and use it as an opportunity to teach. This is what Jesus did. He was spending so much time with tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, and the Pharisees did not like it one bit. They criticized Jesus. They, they said, like, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What did Jesus do? He used this as an opportunity to teach. And he told them this parable, parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and finally, parable of the lost son. So when you have the opportunity, use it as an opportunity to teach. I remember... When we first moved to our second building on Manning Road, we were at 31A Manning Road, and then we purchased a larger building at 29 Manning Road. And I remember the first gathering we have at 29 Manning Road, you know, there was like a large group of people, not as large as this, but um, I remember we had one special item. I think the, the band was singing Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror. And, and, and there's this older couple, uh, he, they must have been shocked that, you know, a church can sing a Michael Jackson song in the sanctuary, and, and they didn't want to have any of it. So what they did was they came forward, 
right, to the front of the stage, not on the stage, but to the front of the stage like here, and then they stomp their feet like this, and then they laugh, you know, in disgust that we as a church, uh, you know, would, um, what do you call that, defile the sanctuary of God by singing a Michael Jackson song. And, and I used that opportunity to teach and remind the people who called Rob's home. I said, remember what Paul said? He said, to the Jew, I became like a Jew in order to win the Jew. To the people with the law, I became like those with the law. To people without the law, I became like those without the law. To the Gentile, I became like a Gentile. Why? For one reason and one reason only. So that I might win them to Christ. We make the rung as low as possible in this church for people to climb on so that they can take that next step to become closer and closer to our Savior, Jesus. You know, we don't do it to entertain people. We don't do it to just for the fun of it. But there's a reason why we do what we do. I use that opportunity to teach. That's what you can do as well, all right? Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24, 35 says this. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Gently instruct. Perhaps God will change those people's heart and they will learn the truth. All right? Here's the thing, though. Um, I, I don't know where I read this. This is not originally mine. This might not even be what it's called. But I call it the 1% rule. Okay? The 1% rule is this. Even if a criticism is inaccurate or malicious, it may contain a small nugget of truth that is valid, all right? It may contain some truth in there somewhere. So pay attention because that might be a life changer for you. Don't just dismiss everything as negative, all right? You got to take it on as much as possible. Um, Psalm 139, verse 22, 24 says this, Search me, God. This is the prayer of David. This is what you need to pray every single day because our heart is so deceitful. Jeremiah said, who can understand it, right? We can fool ourselves so easily that we always do things right. We can fool ourselves that, no, we don't need this advice. No, we can come up with a thousand and one reasons, as I said before, why this criticism is not valid. You know, our heart is so deceitful, let me tell you. It's so deceitful. You can even deceive yourself. So this is what you should pray. This is how I should pray. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. All right? So that's what you do. Consider the source. Examine the truthfulness. But at the end of the day, there will always be critics around you. All right? You just got to take a deep breath, and then you got to run your own race. Okay? Because you can never shake them off. They will always be around you. Uh, I love this quote by uh, U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. This is a very famous quote, by the way. You know, it was quoted by Nelson Mandela. It was quoted by Nixon when he resigned. Uh, it was tattooed on Miley Cyrus' arm, if in case you don't know. Uh, this quote is an amazing quote. It's called The Man in the Arena. Uh, it was first delivered April 23rd, 1910. That's like a long time ago, okay? This is what it says. This is powerful. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, right? This is so powerful. You know, don't listen to the people in the arena, all right? Spectators always know best. My grandma can kick that goal. You know, what are you doing, right? You know, we always criticize people thinking that we know best, but unless you're in the arena, let me tell you, I, 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 I saw this uh, TED Talk by Brene Brown. She's amazing. If you haven't seen her TED Talk, it's amazing. She quoted from this and then paraphrased it in her own way. It might be a little bit offensive to some of you, but this is powerful. This is what Brene Brown says. If you're not also in the arena getting your behind kick, I'm not interested in your feedback. All right? How powerful is that? You know, if they're, if they're not there in the trenches with you, 
if they don't, if they're not for you, if they're not fighting alongside you, maybe you can just ignore their criticism, all right? Because they're always gonna be there. But I want to close with this. You gotta watch out for the biggest critic of all. You know who's the biggest critic of all? It's you. Biggest critic of all is you. What you say to yourself is so powerful. It's so powerful. It's even more powerful than God's word. Let me tell you that, right? Whatever God's word is trying to say to you, you can dismiss it that easily by whatever you say to yourself. Watch your self-talk because your self-talk is so powerful. Um, In the Life Skill course, you know, uh, we're going to offer this course again sometime soon. Um, you will learn this, all right? You will learn to watch your self-talk. Um, I wish I have a donut. Maybe during the break, we can buy a donut, John, and use it as an object lesson and give everybody a donut. You get a donut, you get a donut, you get a donut, all right? But there are two ways to look at your life, okay? One is uh, looking at it as a critic where you see the hole in the donut. That's what you see. You always see the flaw. You always see what's missing. You always see the whole, H-O-L-E. Or you can see yourself as a performer and you focus on the whole, W-H-O-L-E. And how you see yourself, your self-talk will make tremendous difference in your life. If you are a critic, you are moved, you are motivated by negative feelings that turn into negative thoughts that will become negative actions in your life. But if you see yourself as a performer, you see yourself you know, as a whole, W-H-O-L-E, then you will have positive feelings that will lead to positive thoughts and leading to positive actions. If you think this is new age, it's not. The Apostle Paul says the same thing. Whatever is lovely, whatever is worthy, whatever is truthful, whatever is you know, good, think about these things, right? Don't think about the negative stuff. Then you will become a critic. Not only will you be the biggest critic for yourself, you start influencing others in a negative way. It will spill out. You know, if you're, negative, if you're a negative person, trust me, it will spill out to others. So watch out your self-talk. Things like, oh, I should have. If only, it's not possible. He made me. I can't. I have no choice. I don't know how. Change your language to, I choose to. I want to. I can I may not be able to save $1,000 a month, but I can save $200 a month. I'm going to start with saving $200 a month. You see? Don't say I can't. Say you can. I will. It can be done. I'm able. I don't know yet, but I can learn it. You know? Watch your language. It's very powerful. Imagine yourself on a stand in a stadium, and you take a seat, and you become the biggest critic on yourself. Don't do that to yourself. All right? Don't compare your life with others. You have your own race to run. I want to leave you with this last verse. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that is so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let us throw off, strip off every weight that slows us down, every criticism, every bitterness, every insecurity, every malicious thought, everything that hinders you from running the race that God has set for you. Remember Jeremiah 29 verse 11, I have a great plan for your life, declares the Lord, right? Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you success, to give you life. You got to think about these things. Paul says, I can do all things. I know it's taken out of context, but you can in weaknesses, in strength, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Don't say you cannot. Be a performer. Quote, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. His grace is made perfect. His strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. 
you can do it because God is for you. He's not against you. You have been created fearfully and wonderfully from when you were in your mother's womb. God does not plan to harm your life. He plans to prosper your life because He is for you and not against you. So this morning, whatever it is that you're struggling with, let me encourage you. Strip away all the criticism that you have for yourself, for others, for your church, for your government. You know, do something instead. If it bothers you so much, get into the arena. Fight alongside people. You know, make a difference in this world. Instead of just criticizing and saying things that destroy others, make a change in this world. Because I believe that you're not here in this world just to take up space. You're here to make a difference. You're here to make a difference, not just for yourself, but to the people around you. Watch what negativity has done to your children, to your spouse, to your, hus to your husband, to your wife, the damage it has done. And imagine with me, all right? Imagine if every husband, every wife, every Christ follower in this place, they strip away all their negativity, spirit of criticism, and then instead put on kindness, put on grace, put on love. Man, imagine how, how, how much different your family will be, how much different your church will be, your community will be when you do this. Why don't we stand on our feet as we close our gathering together? If you need prayer for whatever reason, come forward. Our prayer leaders will be standing here. They would love to pray with you and for you. And, and 5 p.m. tonight, Brenton Killeen is here. Uh, he's going to bring in a, fa a fantastic message. You might want to come back and join us at 5 p.m. It's going to be a great time uh, of um, learning together again. All right? Um, it is a custom in our church to be dismissed by receiving a prayer of blessing. So if you have the faith to receive it, why don't we open our hands as a sign of our dependence and trust um, to God. Father God, we thank you for what we heard this morning. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you, God, that you did not consider our past mistakes, our past failures. And instead, you always look to our future. You always look to what we can do together with you. Thank you for your grace that is always enough for every single one of us. And I want to pray right now, God, that you bless every single person who is standing here waiting for you, trusting you, Lord, to bless them with your grace, with your blessing, with your mercy. And we trust, Lord, as we leave this place, your grace will follow after us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. May God bless your children, your grandchildren. May God bless your work, your health. May God bless your ministry. May God bless everything that you do so that through you, people around you will be blessed and God's name will be glorified now and forevermore. All God's people who are blessed, say it together with me. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday.